we're going to be talking about ignition primary voltage. This relates very much so back to crank and cam sensors and to current testing in the primary as well as secondary voltage. Let's review some of the operating principles we're looking at here. The secondary develops a strong magnetic field around the coil. And when the primary current is stopped, that magnetic field collapses, inducing a voltage into the windings. That is the windings of the primary and the secondary. We tie them together because they are identical, and we'll show you about a little later. It usually takes around 3.5 milliseconds to build a strong magnetic field to its maximum. That's our peak saturation time. We don't always have that much time available. We'll show you some stuff about that later. And when the field collapses quickly to try to keep the current flowing in the circuit, it's generating a primary voltage spike ranging from 150 to about 400 volts. Typical is somewhere between 320 and 360. But it is vehicle specific and you need to use your test equipment frequently enough to know what's typical for the vehicle you're working on. Now let's review our primary circuit. It's here on the left. Its job is to build a strong magnetic field. We have a current flow through this winding and then we have a core in the center of this winding that concentrates it between the two different transformers. Now transformer is the word. This is a transformer. It is a step-up transformer meaning it increases voltage while reducing current. It transfers power. If the power is the same and voltage is higher, current must be lower. So we have a high current in the primary, low current in the secondary. We have a few windings in the primary and many windings in the secondary. There are mirror images of each other, and when we collapse this field, it's draining a voltage in each of the windings. And it's a matter of how many windings you have. Now let's look at what this voltage waveform looks like. Here are two waveforms. The blue one on top is our secondary. The yellow one on bottom is our primary. Now in this particular case, we're measuring the primary and the yellow voltage scale going up to slightly, well, going well above 200 volts. We put on the 200 volt scale so they look the same size. Uh, the 400 volt scale looked a little smaller. We want to look the same. Now the only big difference I want you to see is we have a little bit more oscillation in the yellow trace right after the spark starts. That's typical. We'll talk more about this. We're going to talk about tying together primary, secondary, and current flow in crank and cam signals. Next, we're going to start looking at the correlation between injectors, ignition primary, and the crankshaft position sensor. You're looking at the crankshaft position sensor on a Chrysler. It is directly relating ejector and primary all together. Now this is very important to understand. We're going to talk more about it so that you fully appreciate that. Here's another crank position signal. This happens to be off of a GM. And we're going to show you how the primary is controlled by the PCM and that it, how the PCM uses the crank and cam signal for timing. Let's look at this in a little more detail here. Here's our cam right here just for your purposes. Cam is low, cam is high, telling us where number one cylinder is and when to fire. But we're going to look at these purple ones here. This is our coil control. It's going to go low, go up, go high, and then it repeats itself over here. Now notice how this coil control, where we're turning current flow on, this is the signal that's going to talk, tell the computer to turn current flow on to start building the magnetic field around the coil. Notice how tightly it's related to this signal. Here is a 18x signal. At the bottom of the purple is the coil control, in this case electronic spark timing. It's going to be telling the module when to saturate the coil and turn the current flow on and when to turn it off. Notice that each one of these pulses is exactly three 18x signals wide. Now what we're trying to stress here is the importance of how this relates back to crank and cam. If we're missing pulses in the crank or cam, it completely messes this whole equation up. The computer is relying on this signal to do this work for it. So it doesn't have to do a bunch of complicated computations. Look at coil B here. It's going to go up. 
and short two times. Let's look at exactly what it's doing there. We talked about it before. Here's a blown up version of it. Look how that purple coil control for current flow perfectly matches the crankshaft signal. It starts up when it goes down and turns off when it comes back to zero. So as this signal goes down and back up, and it doesn't matter if it's a magnetic pickup or a hall effect. We've shown you both types now. One of them had three pulses in the hall effect would determine the width of this signal. In this particular case, it's the width of this 1F7X signal. We're trying to make sure you understand the importance of this relationship. Now, we do not expect you to do this with your lab scope. But when we're talking about the importance of crank and cam, we want you to understand logically when you see something going wrong in qual primary, qual secondary, and they don't look like they're regularly spaced and doing what you expect them to do, it can be very much caused by the crank and cam signals. Now we've stressed the importance of these time and time again, but we want you to see this. We wanted this study to drive home the function of the crank and cam signal plays in the control of the primary. Now the timing of these events will change off idle, but the relationship is going to remain. And some DIS and coil and plug systems use the PCM to control the coil current. That's just a specialized thing. That's why we call it a coil pack versus a DIS module. Here's an example of a coil pack. Notice that primary one is controlled on that wire and primary two is controlled on here. This is a four cylinder Ford and we have two coils both controlled by the PCM. We have power going in on the blue wire to both of our coils and the output going to two different spark plugs. Now we can diagnose this by connecting our primary leads to the brown and blue wire on pin 1 and the brown and green wire on pin 3 and we'll be able to get a primary signal. We can go measured on the secondary. It doesn't matter. This is a description of a coil pack. It has no electronics inside. All the electronics for switching is done by the PCM. Now here is a secondary signal. What we do when we open it up, we go up to about 340 volts in this case, and we get that by looking over to the side. We're somewhere between 300 and 360, not quite at 360, maybe 340, somewhere in that range. We're not too concerned about that, but we've got to have a good spike. If we do not get a good high spike like this in the coil primary, we will not have the maximum available voltage in the secondary. Remember, it is the primary that's turning voltages in all the windings. We just have many more windings in the secondary than we do the primary. And the next thing we want to look at is the spark voltage. Once the spark starts, whether we're looking at primary or secondary, it drops down to a level. In this case, you see that little bit of noise we talked about, about oscillations. And the voltage level is about 40 volts. We get that by simply going across and looking that it's slightly less than the 50 volt shown on the other scale. So we have information about both primary and secondary available to you here. We keep tying them together because they are almost identical. They are very much alike. Now let's look at how we utilize these to identify a bad quantum plug unit. People say, hey, tell me how to diagnose call and plug. On this one screen, we're going to show you how to diagnose call and plug. In this particular case, we're looking at three signals. The yellow is the control signal. It's going to give us the signal of when to turn current flow on, and that's the blue trace. Current flow goes up, and it goes up quite high. Here's where we turn it on, and then here's where we turn it off. When we turn it off, we find out that we have nearly 15 amps of current flow. Wow, nearly 15 amps. Over here on the normal pattern for a similar vehicle, we measured and it's under 10. So the first giveaway, we have a problem, is this bad coil draws almost 15 amps, while a normal coil pack only draws 10. Let's find another way to find it. So we know that this less than 10, really about eight and a half, nine, would be normal. But let's look at the spark. Here is our secondary, because we can't get to the primary on this particular one. This is a GM, and the primary is not visible. The coil has switching built in. Therefore, we can only see the secondary. 
We know we have a bad plug because you looked at current flow or bad coil units, coil on plug unit. We confirm it here. Now we have a lot of people that tell us we don't even bother diagnosing coil on plug. We go out and buy a new one and plug it in. Well, that's okay if you want to do it that way. When your quick diagnosis doesn't work, here's how you do real diagnostics. It only takes you a couple minutes to do this test here at the bottom. Have a quick look and see what the, how it's doing. If it's not doing worth anything, we have no spark available. We have very low voltage. If we could have primary, we'd have very low primary. Use either low amps probe, secondary, whatever you want to do. We know it was not a crankshaft position sensor problem because we had a good control signal. Now see how they begin to tie together. This is diagnostics taking you to the next level. And that's important. Now some vehicles are going to use multi-spark ignition systems. This happens to be a secondary problem, a pattern, but we showed you before they all go together. We'll talk about current flow on these and have a look at it. Here's current flow from our library. At low ice idle speed, we may have two or three sparks. As we increase slightly, we'll see them drop down. We judge the peak amps always by the first pulse. Notice this is only drawing around seven and a half, a little over on the peak amps. Now we're going to study how we go about diagnosing. Now we can diagnose secondary ignition problems in the primary pattern because of the relationship we've already shown you. And we start off by looking at the, the speak up here. It goes up to about 360 volts, which we find is a very good voltage. Remember, lower voltages would cause problems and would not be acceptable. We have a couple problems at the bottom. One of them is an EGR here. Now, we have a lean out shown on the left, EGR in the middle. And we're doing this for a reason. Now, we keep telling you and stressing that this is a function. The voltage that we see is a function of the mixture once the spark starts. It's ionization of gases in the combustion chamber. The more carbon monoxide, the more hydrocarbons we have, the lower the resistance. As we burn hydrocarbons, we increase resistance. Now on the left, the lean out, we see it ever increasing with one quick spike down. But the majority of the time, resistance is going up. Now, what's different about that than the EGR in the middle? We have resistance going up, down, up, down, increasing. Very low, very high. This is because of extreme turbulence. Now, it can be caused by one of three problems. Big fuel droplets are possible, but unlikely. It usually gets vaporized better than that coming through the valves. Then the EGR is our number one cause. And the third problem is intake valve leaks and head damage causing turbulence. Anything that causes extreme turbulence can cause a pattern like this. But look where we're diagnosing. On the patterns we're looking at, we've got all of them showing lean conditions because they're all sloping up and EGR in the middle. So we know right off the bat, we need to find the cause of the lean mixture and excessive EGR. We're going to have to go check fuel delivery and EGR action on this vehicle. The purpose of all of our logical diagnosis is to give you a test to tell you what to test next. Now, this is the type of diagnostic you should be doing. Where else are you going to find lean mixture and EGR problems in just a few minutes we've talked about here? It's the productivity of a test that makes its value. What's the payback on doing it? Now, we don't tell you to go hook up the scope on every car, but you might want to do that early on to get used to using it. Then start using this to pinpoint specific problems you cannot find with voltmeters and scan tools. Secondary adapters, they're going to allow us to put all the cylinders on the screen at one time for comparison. But sometimes primary connections are easier, and we've showed you some cases like that. It's difficult to connect coil on plug systems that do not have plug wires without unplugging them all and much, make, hooking a bunch of adapters in, which we don't find that productive. Secondary adapters. Our units are expensive in some DSO lab scopes. We use primary voltage when it's easier to test to connect than it is to connect other ways. If it's easier to get the primary, use primary voltage. If it's harder, don't. And we'll show you some cases where it is harder. 
we're going to use the diagnostic details and definitions and things we saw in the secondary ignition testing right here in our primary testing. But remember, the primary voltage must be good before the secondary has the proper voltage available to give us maximum KV. And some cop units have electronic switching inside of the coil and plug, and they don't have primaries available. We'll have to use secondary, even if we have to use an adapter. Here's what the diagnostics look like. We have three very common things on the screen at one time. On the left is a lean out, very much like what we're just looking at in that primary signal. This is a secondary signal, but it looks like the primary signal we're looking at. They're just like, they're all alike. In the middle is a short to ground. Notice the voltage required to start the spark is quite low and not nearly at the level it is for the one on the right. Look for firing outside the cylinder where the mixture is not compressed and we don't have compression to fight. And look at the bad plug wire over here. That bad plug wire will cause a problem very soon. It's not causing a misfire yet because we still have spark. It's a little shorter, but we still have available spark. All three of these problems will give you a misfire code. Any one of them or any combination. And we haven't even shown you the EGR we were just looking at earlier. One of the things we keep stressing is to do tests that have a high payback. Give you dividends for the work you're doing. We keep stressing. You don't do this in every car. You do this to pull out the big guns when you've tried your routine diagnostics and they didn't work. We've tried to show you the relationship between crank, cam, and ignition. The relationship between primary and secondary and how they all work together. So utilize this for more effective diagnostics.